<laughs> All right. Um, we have to go through a transformation in our thinking about human beings. 2 Corinthians 5.16, we looked at it briefly last time. From now on, we regard no one katasarka, according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. A transformation has got to take place so that we view human beings the way God does, made in his image, reflecting that image in all the glorious things humans are able to do by God's strength. So Augustine's quotation here is so appropriate. Listen to what he says. We stand in awe of the ocean, the thunderstorm, the sunset, the mountains, but we pass by a human being without notice, even though the person is God's most magnificent creation. Oh, it's hard to believe that, isn't it? We get so used to each other. We get so used to being God's most magnificent creation that we do. We pass by one another and pass by another human being without feeling the weightiness and the wonder of what it is we're passing by. And so uh, we've got to ask God to change our thinking. You know, you hear people say things, you know, I worship God far better at the beach by myself than with people at church. It should really give us pause when we hear things like that, when we think of the fact that human beings are made in the very image and likeness of God. And think about that. I worship God by myself better at the beach than with all those people made in His image in whom the Holy Spirit dwells. There's something really wrong with that. Now, I understand it. I can relate to it. I look forward to times getting away in beautiful nature by myself, but, but there's a disconnect of some kind if I don't see God's most magnificent creation in you guys. In, in other people, including myself. So we've got to get this. We've, we've got to understand this so differently than we do. You know, I actually think that it's important to think of ways to train ourselves to think rightly because what happens very often, you know, I played football for years and man, did I realize how important preparation was. If you tried to get out and play a football game without preparing physically, mentally, as a team, to execute, you would get destroyed. You'd get hurt. You wouldn't accomplish anything effectively. And so we should also think about our Christian lives that way, that we shouldn't just wait for difficult times to practice the right responses. I think we should actually figure out ways to practice spiritual disciplines to train ourselves in certain beliefs. And so I, I'm always thinking, how can I prepare ahead of time? Because I don't want to have to try to love somebody when it's hard to do it without having prepared it all for that. That would be foolish. And so I actually, I think of ways to, to exercise my beliefs even when I don't have to. One of the ways I've tried to get the image of God in my head better is by focusing on the people around me that, that, rather than at times the event I'm at. Uh, so, you know, I'm from Connecticut, and so going to Disney's a big deal for people from Connecticut. I know some of you are raised around here, and you're totally jaded to the, the wonder of a place like Disney. But um, when you grew up where I grew up, you go once, maybe twice in your whole life to Disney World, and you drive through the night, you know, a day and a half straight down the coast to Disney <laughs> World. And, and, uh, and, and that means you max out the one time you go. And you, you're there when the gate opens, right? You're not there strolling in mid-morning. Come on, no. And you'd never think of leaving before all the possible festivities were done. I don't care how tired you are. You're sticking it out. And, and so you have to value this. So when we moved out here, it was very strange to meet. We met our realtor on our first visit out here. And, and he said, no, no, I can't meet tonight. We're having dinner at Disney. Do you imagine how strange that sounded to my ears. You mean just like you're going for an hour and a half to Disney? Yeah, I'm just going, to, really? That's so bizarre to me. And so it, it's, it's been sort of impossible to get this max out sort of mentality when you go to Disney. So uh, even though we had passes for a while, I still always had this sense of fast passes, make the most out of it, right? Running around all the time. Uh, shoving little kids out of the way to get on Splash Mountain and stuff. Get out of here, you little brat. Um, Make it up for all that last time when I was in Connecticut, lost time when I was in Connecticut. But so, the fireworks, when I see people streaming out before the fireworks to beat the traffic, I just want to choke them. 
What's wrong with you? And so when there are fireworks, I position myself. You know how they're over the enchanted castle and, and they're choreographed to the music and Tinkerbell goes across and it's just so cool. Except for the lyrics of the music, which I despise. Believe, only believe, just believe. And I'm like, what, what do you want me to believe? <laughs> Does it even matter to you what I believe? I don't think it does. That concerns me. All right, so, um, so I don't listen to the word. I try to block out the lyrics, but I so love the whole pyrotechnics of it all. But here's what I've made myself do when I've gone to Disney. We'll position ourselves, you know, in a, in a really good place to see the castle and see the fireworks and everything. And as soon as they start... I turn around and I turn my back to the fireworks and I make myself watch people watch fireworks. Because God tells me that they are more beautiful than the fireworks. Now, they've been an annoyance to me all day because they're, they're pushing out of the way, like, except for the Southern Californians who are just walking around. But, but, <laughs> but I force myself to view these people in the way God says, when all, everything in me wants to be watching the fireworks, I make myself watch the people. And it's hard at first, but the more I, I will do that, the more it really starts to be true. And I'm able to see it. And so I turn my back on this amazing display of beauty for something God says is way more beautiful. And I watch people, and the more I watch, the more I let myself do that, the more beautiful they become. And so I, it really works. I'll watch this little old lady in a wheelchair become a little girl again, watching the fireworks, you know. It's like, oh, she's great. I'd love to talk to her. Or I will see this, this young dad with his son on his shoulders, who's, the son squealing in delight at these fireworks. And the son is taking far more delight in the son's delight than in the fireworks. And that's beautiful. And I say, oh, that's great. I'd love to get to know them. And then there's this young couple arm in arm. You know, romance is blooming. More fireworks in their eyes than in the sky as they're <laughs> enjoying this time together, right? And before you know it, it really is coming true. That as hard as it was to turn my back in the beautiful fireworks, I actually start to see beauty in people. And I leave that place so different walking around all these people and by all these people that could have just easily been a nuisance to me. And so I, I try to train myself to do these. Now, when someone, in the rare case, notices I'm doing this, it's actually kind of creepy. <laughs> right, because they're like, I did the fireworks. Right. <laughs> and, and they check their wallet because they think I'm stealing things or something. But no, I'm just looking at your beauty. That's creepy. Get out of here. And so, uh, and so but I, I think we need to look for opportunities to train ourselves and preach to ourselves. Guys, I preach to myself all the time. Sometimes audibly, sometimes loud with conviction I preach to myself. By myself in the car. I'll even drive by someone and I'll feel a disdain rise in my heart. And I will say, Eric, the very image of God is what you just drove by. And I, I want to think so differently than I naturally do. And so I think we need to train ourselves for this sort of thing. Okay, guys, it's so important we understand that human beings are made in the image of God and the most glorious thing in creation, even though we get so used to each other. Well, if you don't have a definition for humanity like we do, I mean, we've made the, the distinction in our minds, uh, in the way we define things, A, it is raining. I don't know what that's from. <laughs> One option. Um, oh, doing logic stuff. Yes, yes, okay. Good. Um, we've talked about the difference between a definition that is an ontological, ontological and functional Definition. You can define things ontologically. How do we ground our definition of humans? Ontologically or functionally? Ontologically. ontologically, right? What a human being is essentially. Now, function flows from essence, 
but we ground our definition in essence because function comes and goes. Function's relative. Uh, function is fluctuating. Ontology always remains. Function is an expression of, expression of what we are, but it always remains. And so we ground our definition in ontology. If you don't have this, though, you have no option but to define a human being by function. That's all you've got. If you don't have something like we're talking about, that we're made in the very image and likeness of God, and inherently then deserve profound dignity and value and respect. If you don't have that, all you've got is the stuff we're doing. That's all you've got. That's all you're left with is function. And when you then try to define a person, you're going to have to do it functionally. You don't have any other option. And that's exactly what social scientists try to do for us, is define personhood according to function, which is all they've got to work with. And there was actually a major resurgence of, of personhood debate, humanhood debate in the early 70s. The granddaddy of this debate is a guy named Joseph Fletcher. And I have his, his findings here. He's an ethicist from Princeton. And in a book, Situation Ethics, he has a section called Indicators of Humanhood, a Tentative Profile of Man. And here are his, what he calls, 15 positive criteria for personhood. Here they are, minimal intelligence, self-awareness, self-control, sense of time, sense of futurity, a sense of the past, the capability to relate to others, concern for others, communication, you see it what they are. You have these 15, you get to be human. This spawns books, articles, conferences, and social scientists get together from all different disciplines and boil the discussion down to these four Indicators of humanhood, as they call it. In this article, Four Indicators of Humanhood, the inquiry matures. And here's what they are. Here are the four essential criteria for humanity to exist. One, self-awareness. Two, relational ability. Three, happiness. Four, neocortical brain functioning, which is what Fletcher says is the cardinal condition. Okay. So here we are. What's that, Kate? Wow. Yeah, wow. Okay. Well... That's what you've got. So where does this lead? We don't have to wonder. If you look at the next page, Peter Singer takes this way of defining humans to its logical conclusion. And I do not say logical extreme. I say logical conclusion. This is what Singer says in his book, Practical Ethics. I have argued that the life of a fetus is of no greater value than the life of a non-human animal at a similar level of rationality, self-consciousness, awareness, capacity to feel, etc. Those should all sound familiar to you, right? Those are the positive criteria of personhood that we just saw. Okay, so uh, a similar level of these things is had by a fetus and a non-human animal. Now, it must be admitted that these arguments apply to the newborn baby as much as to the fetus. If the fetus does not have the same claim to life as a person, it appears that the newborn baby does not either, and the life of a newborn baby is of less value than the life of a, do a, a pig, a dog, or a chimpanzee. Well, I appreciate his honesty. I appreciate his logical consistency, don't you? I mean, what magically happens at birth that now gives that baby the right to life? Now, that baby deserves protection. Something magically, what happens in the third trimester? Matter of fact, what happens in the first 18 months that now makes that child worthy of protection and dignity and respect? Why do they deserve human rights and human value and dignity? now that they've been born as opposed to before. And if it is a matter of function, well, isn't it true that there are animals that have higher functioning capabilities in some of these cardinal criteria than newborn babies do? This is not sort of a whacked out leap from where we start with functional definitions, is it? Katie. Um, Hmm. 
Well, I mean, Singer would never say, oh, then you can just go around killing whoever you want under two, or uh, someone who lacks this ability. But when it becomes a question of suffering in life, or difficulty in life, or challenges in life, we start to need to ask the question, is this wor life worth living given all this suffering? And so, um, if it hasn't attained this level of functional expression yet, does it really deserve then the same value we put on someone who is fully functioning in all these ways? Yeah, these are Singer's conclusions, right? Um, well, let's think about this. If you functionally define humans, what's going on? Well, the first point I have here in your notes is it, a functional view, I hope you realize, stresses the quality of life as opposed to the sanctity of life. Now, there isn't something inherently sacred of, in human life. That sacredness, that value, that dignity is the result of a particular functioning capability, not just inherent in that human life. It's a very different way of approaching humanity and its dignity and value. Second, let's think about the subjective nature of this criteria. I mean, if you, if, if you look at these bases for human value, wh why do they pick the ones they do? Do you find it odd that creativity isn't on there? There obviously wasn't an artist in the group. When the discussion was taking place, no, no athletic ability, no sense of humor. How about worship expression? Why, why wouldn't that be? There seems to be such a subjectivity to this. Why do they pick the things they do? How about race? Can I put race on there? What if I could demonstrate to you that there are certain racial groups on the planet that are not functioning as well as others? Can I put race on there? Can I put, you need to be a Christian to be considered human. And if not, why not? Uh, it seems so subjective. And not only subjective in what, what they pick to define humanity, but even defining these things. I mean, just what Katie was saying. I, she's, she's studying cognitive development, and, and there's a lack of a self-awareness the children have that's just wild. I mean, they think things disappear when they can't see them, right? including you. Uh, and, and so, uh, what does it mean to be self-aware? How self-aware do you have to be uh, to be considered human? Uh, you know, I got knocked out in a football game once on a Friday night and I did not regain consciousness until Sunday evening. I was anything but self-aware. And I won't go into detail, but anything but self-controlled. <laughs> it was a bad weekend. Now, if you came into my house and shot me, should you be arrested for the murder of a human? Or something that had forfeited its humanity that weekend? Now, we could talk about potential expression of these things. I hadn't lost at least the potential to do that. But, but it, it's pretty wild to start to think about the relative. Happiness? How happy do I have to be? <laughs> and how do you even define happiness? I mean, it's just amazing to me how relatively expressed and therefore defined these things are. Uh, what else? Well. If you adopt a purely functional definition of personhood, where does it stop? There's a relative expression. I mean, an IQ of 40, there are certain things that you can't do once your IQ is below 40, but why 40? Why settle for such a, a low expression of functionality? Why not 70, 90? How about just above Joseph Fletcher's IQ? We'll just put it right there, that notch right there. And if not, why not? It's just amazing to me how relative and subjective these things are. And, but then, I mean, the slippery slope is, is sometimes a fallacy, but sometimes it's a really good question. Why do you stop where you do, and where does it stop? Okay, maybe I have all these functional abilities, but there are people who have all of these better than I do, better than you do. 
Are they more human than you? Do they deserve more dignity then than you? I mean, at the end of the day, I guess the question is, why wasn't Hitler right? If you can demonstrate certain verifiable functional deficiencies in certain people groups, why isn't genocide a good idea? If it really is about survival of the fittest and trying to strengthen the gene pool the best we can, why then wouldn't we have a justifiable reason for genocide? if we can dis demonstrate that certain groups are contributing less to the gro gross domestic product than others. It's not functioning at quite the same level as others. Uh, pretty disturbing implications here. All right, I want you to watch something. Like a good theologian watches things. Was any, were any of you alive in 1980? Nope, not even close, huh? <laughs> Were you, any of you alive in the decade of the 80s? A few, woohoo! <laughs> Go 80s, yes, all right. I want you to watch something, um, like a good theologian. Let me just tell you, 1980, there was a horrific war in Lebanon. That's not what I want you to watch. I'll turn it on in a second. Don't watch her, don't watch her. Watch me. Um, I'm much more interesting than she is, I'm just kidding. Um, look over here, not at her, or him. Um, horrible war in the 80s in Lebanon, Beirut, the capital city, was bombed beyond recognition. They evacuated the entire city. Imagine evacuating the capital city of your nation. And they left behind a hospital full of handicapped kids in Beirut. Mother Teresa found out about this, said she wanted to go get them. The Red Cross, the American government, the Lebanese government, the Catholic Church all said, you're not going because it's better to lose a hospital full of kids than to lose a hospital full of kids and 30 nuns. So you can't go. And she says, well, what if there's a ceasefire? And they said, well, if it's long enough for you to get it done, you can go, but only for the length of the ceasefire. So she prays there's a ceasefire, there is one, and this is what happens. Oh, I don't think one of those kids would have done very well with the test of these criteria for personhood. I think every one of them would have failed miserably. Most of them will never say a complete sentence in their lives. So why in the world do you risk your life to go save them? Why would you do that? Should you? Should a new Nobel Peace Prize winner risk her life to save a kid who will never, never have a job, never play a violin, never be very self-aware or self-controlled? So why do you do it? Why would you do that? What has to be going on for you to do something like that? Yeah, a basic understanding of who those kids are and where their worth comes from. Why they're worth risking your life to save. Why do you do that unless you think so differently about human worth and dignity and value than we typically naturally do? You know, it's easy for us to, to read this stuff by Peter Singer and be appalled. And we should be appalled. Is it a surprise to you that every single day Peter Singer was on the faculty at Princeton as an ethics professor of all things? Every single day, disabled people protested outside his office building. That shouldn't surprise you. They, far better than most of us, see the implications of this kind of teaching. They get it. They, they know where he's going when you start to talk the way he does. Uh, but it's, and so it's easy for us to be appalled at saying things like a newborn baby is of worth less value than a chimpanzee. And in his, his book subsequent to this, Unsanctifying Human Life, 
Um, he actually goes so far as to advocate sexual relations between animals and humans. And based on his presuppositions, well, why not? And so we can recoil at these sorts of ideas and see the horrific implications. But what I want us to do is be careful that we don't miss the ways we think very functionally about people. The way our respect and love and value we put on people is a result of function. Not what God says is fund fundamentally true about them. We all have that inclination, don't we, to value people, including ourselves, based on the same garbage the world values and that Hollywood says is important rather than what God says is important. And I know this is true. We've got so many of the same effects of functional definitions of people in the church that are present in the world. And we can strive after the things that are just superficial and according to the flesh in our own lives and in the way we value other people. I, I'm fascinated. Do you know there was a game they played in the 70s? Do, do you think it's just a coincidence that this debate started in 1972 and in the 70s was when this was a really huge issue? Do you think that there might be something going on historically that made that the case? What do you think it might have been? What's that? Hippies, well, yeah. But do you know what it was? Roe v. Wade, 1973, we legalize abortion. We decide as a society that it's legal to kill an unborn baby. Now, if you're going to do that, you need to scramble for a definition of humanity that allows you to do that. Or not, but, but you, you're suddenly re very concerned about defining personhood. If we've just decided that a whole kind of person now can be killed, we better have a definition of personhood. It's no coincidence this thing really took off in the 70s in this way. And so uh, we need to ask God, what are ways that I'm defining people functionally, though? Do you, do you know there was a game they played called Lifeboat in Public Schools in the 70s and 80s where you were given this ethical dilemma. You gave kids an ethical dilemma, and the dilemma was there's a lifeboat that's sinking, and there are 10 people on it. It gave you detailed descriptions of these 10 people, a Down syndrome baby, an elderly woman, a doctor, a... Uh, uh, a homemaker, a, a person who's got a disease, and all these people, and the boat is sinking, and the only way to stop everyone from dying in the sinking boat is to throw people off, and so the kid's job was to choose who you threw off and in what order. Yeah. Values clarification, ethical dilemmas, and you teach kids these sorts of things. Now, I find, I don't want to push it too far, but I do find it fascinating that the most popular shows on television these days often are ones where we throw people off islands. <laughs> we even get to vote. Right? We get to be part of throwing people off. And we sit around, stand around the water cooler at work saying, I can't stand her, I hope she's the next one to go. Boy, he's so lame, he can't even fish or hunt. How, what kind of help is he going to be? And then we got American Idol, we got Dance with Stars, and we just love to ruthlessly critique other people and their ability to do things. Now, I think competition's fine, and, and people need to be able to hear, you know, you're not, just not a good singer. People need to be able to deal with that. <laughs> but I think there's also something else going on there. We just love to evaluate people based on all of these functional abilities, right? And we watch a Mother Teresa and we say, you go, lady. But then we don't necessarily orient our lives the same way. We chase after the same wood, hay, and stubble the world does. And there are people in our lives that we have nothing but disdain for. And, and we excuse it with pithy expressions like, well, I need to love you, but I don't have to like you. And we are really thinking functionally about people no differently than these guys. So why do you do this? You know, a reporter one time said to Mother Teresa, Mother Teresa, I wouldn't do what you do for all the money in the world. You know what she said? Neither would I. <laughs> yeah, that was a good answer. Yes, that does deserve applause. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, she's not doing it for money. She's not doing it for superficial things. She's doing it because some, some fundamental beliefs about what human beings are drives all of this. So I would love for you to, to start to take some real um, inventory of your heart and say, how, how am I doing in the way I value people? What are the pe who are the people I like? Who are the people I think are great and I value and appreciate and applaud and want to be with? Who are the people that I think are great? Are they ones who have certain functional abilities, often the ones that I have myself, and that those are the people that I really think are great? I don't know who it is for you. Maybe it's a, a, a racial group. Maybe it's a kind of person. Maybe it's somebody in your own family who you have a really hard time seeing has made the very image of God because they've functionally not done very well in caring for you. And you know, maybe the person you have a hardest time believing is made in God's image is yourself. Maybe you need to take a hard look at where you see your worth coming from and start there. Because if you define yourself by function, you're invariably going to do that with other people too. Katie. Oh yeah, I, it's a constant battle for me to, to believe these things and apply them in my life. That's why I preach to myself all the time. Sometimes loudly and audibly and with conviction. Usually when not other people are around. But, but I do, I preach sermons to myself. And, and I will, with all, all kinds of relationships and people, have to do that. I've seen wonderful improvement where it becomes more intuitive over time and it doesn't take a constant sermon that I preach to myself, but, but it still is a battle every day. Yeah. Okay. Any thoughts or questions? I think if we could get a hold of this, really get a hold of it, it would be radical and wonderful and transforming. Especially in Southern California, which is so shallow in what it values. We live in Tinseltown. How about that for a name of a town? Tinseltown. Just something just sprinkled on the top to make it look glittery. Um, it's very little realness around here. We flew into Maine this summer, took the girls to Maine, and we got, we landed in the airport and my wife said, oh yes, women have gray hair here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I forgot that women have gray hair in, in Maine. And it must be the water, it must be something in the water, I don't know what it is, but, but, but Southern California just don't even have gray hair, especially women, you know, so so there is this need to do everything we can to desperately fit these functional abilities and, and images that mean nothing from God's perspective. Are not what matters, not where human worth and dignity and value comes from. Um, so it, it takes some serious work. Let me pray for us. Lord, would you please help us to have transformed thinking so our lives would look so different and we wouldn't battle so many of the things we battle when it comes to loving people well and, and viewing ourselves the way you do. Help us, Lord, please, to, to get this right and to be wonderfully different and fruitful and influential because of it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, and that, that can be all appropriate. It, and the, the, the reality here is, we, the, Mother Teresa's looking at this little deformed child because of disease, because of the curse and the effects of the fall, and he, he's malnutritioned, and there is a twisted, twistedness to this that we need to acknowledge. To, to get what we're talking about doesn't mean you're simplistic and, and naive. I mean, she's doing everything she can to alleviate the malnutrition. But she's still able to touch his face and say, lovely child. She sees right through the deformity 
to the beauty of this child being made in the image of God. And so that's true not just with, with natural effects of the fall like deformities. It's true with all the effects of sin, with things that are legitimately frustrating and sad and grievous and even angering. But in the midst of all of it, is it obvious to us and everybody else that, that the people that are making us legitimately angry are made in the very image of God? Now, I think it's profound that these are all Muslim kids. These are all children of Muslim people. She brought them from the Muslim side of the city. She didn't go save a bunch of Christian kids. She saves kids who are made in the image of God regardless of the religious affiliation of their families. So, so this, is, this is this great leveler, leveler, leveler of humanity that we operate out of. It's a wonderful truth that, that gives us the definition that we then love people out of regardless of all of these earthly distinctions. And so, John, I, I, we've got to learn to have the kind of emotional maturity that mirrors God's emotional life where we, we have legitimate anger and frustration and grief, but we love in the midst of all of it. We see right through it all to the truth of who someone is, even when we think they're being very destructive to other people and themselves. So to have a prophetic anger in the midst of an abiding love for people and all of it is the tough, tough thing. I'm good at one or the other, but pulling them both off at the same time is tough. Miles. How do you respond to the, like, just the saying, I don't have to like you, but I have to love you? Yeah, I get it. Yeah, Here's the truth of the expression, I, I, don't have, I have to love you, but I don't have to like you. The truth of it is, a lot of times there's a process of getting to legitimate affection for people based on my commitment to love them, even though I don't naturally do that. And so on the way to true love for people, I can experience a commitment to love them in the absence of a like of them, an affection for them. But the Bible says to love people earnestly from the heart. I'm just not sure how I have to love you but don't have to like you fits into that. I, I can appreciate um, a process to that, but I want to love people in a holistic, heartfelt, meaningful way that I actually feel and don't just commit to. And, and so that's why I, I, I'm concerned about an expression like that used to give me permission to maintain disdain for people, yet I have a commitment to not hurt them or something. It's not enough. I don't think that's enough. It, it's part of the process sometimes, but it's not enough. Okay, I do want to talk. Go ahead, Steve. I mean, there, there are even people groups you can come through, come from where hatred for a people group is just part of being part of that group. I mean, that's what you do. It's not just in Rwanda. It, I mean, the Turks and Armenians, goodness. Uh, and there's good reason. So, um, how do you do that? How do you pull that off? Because there's legitimate reason. And I, if you didn't have a kind of hatred for evil, something's wrong with you. Something's dead inside of you. So I want to encourage that. But never to the point where you put someone in a different category than yourself when it comes to being a sinner in need of forgiveness. Uh, there, there are expressions of evil that we should have great hatred for, but never to the point where I then see that expression as something totally outside of possibility in my own life. If I don't always see the potential in me to become the thing I hate, I'm missing something, right? So, uh, so I think we need to be really good haters, godly haters. God hates all sin and evil, and we should too. But in the midst of it, there's always this capacity for forgiveness, for love, for grace, for mercy, and for, for fallen humans to recognize I have been forgiven so much. Almighty God in all His holiness has forgiven me. How in the world could I then withhold forgiveness from this other human being? Even though there is grave evil that is done. That's the tough thing. That's why Christians defy natural inclinations and, and we love our enemies. What? And it's the Christians who need to set that standard. Katie. Um, I was just thinking in response to that. Yeah. Like what, what makes you find that you have? Yeah, you know, let me, let me go there by going where I was intending to go. I, Let's make these, these conclusions biblically here on the bottom of 54. And hopefully we'll get to exactly what, what you're asking about, right? Uh, these four things are really important. Humans have an essential personhood that remains in all functional circumstances. 
all functional circumstances. Every human being is a person created in God's image from conception to the point of death. And the life of every human person is sacred and deserving of love and protection. And finally, love for God must show itself in love for humans made in His image. Those are these biblical anchors we have in our doctrine of humanity that have radically practical implications. And here's how I want to get to answering that really good question. Well, what about function? Uh, where, how, how should we view that then in light of uh, our definition being grounded in ontology? Well, let, let's get there by, by going through. I really want to get through this today. Um, you read the chapter on these constitutional nature of human being issues. We're not going to dive into that in class. I'm going to just trust you. Read it carefully. Know it well. Study this. I want you to know these terms. Know that Christianity is fundamentally dualistic and monism is a pagan idea where there aren't distinctions, there aren't distinctions within God himself, between God and creation, uh, between humans and the creation itself, that material and uh, spiritual, there, there aren't these distinctions. And so monism is there's one kind of reality where the Bible says there is a spiritual reality and a physical reality, and they, it's ever since creation, are always working together. Dualism, yes, dualism, absolutely. In this sense, uh, that there are two distinct uh, component parts to reality, spiritual realm and physical realm. Uh, monism is this idea that there's only one kind of reality, and there's materialistic monism, which says matter is all there is, there's no spiritual realm. There's idealistic monism that says everything that is is spirit, that even the appearance of this material reality is not real, it's, a, it's an appearance. And so Christian scientists, for instance, are idealistic monists. They don't believe that the material world exists. Uh, that's why they won't get medical help in, in certain circumstances, because to acknowledge uh, an illness is to acknowledge the reality of the material world, which you don't want to do if you're, you're going to stay consistent to your metaphysics. So, um, but we are dualistic as Christians, in general when it comes to reality and specifically when it comes to humanity. There are at least two distinct component parts to a human being, spiritual and physical, and that is a fundamental understanding of humanity. Now within dualism, you can talk about dichotomy or trichotomy. Are we just body and soul or body, soul, and spirit? Are soul and spirit two distinct things? Grudem unpacks those well for you. We don't need to do it again. I want you to know those terms. What's Grudem, a dichotomist or a trichotomist? Yes, yes, you're reading well. I love it. He argues for dichotomy, good. Uh, then there is the issue of the, the origin of the immaterial soul. Is it a part of natural human conception as traducianism teaches, or is it a unique creation of God, uh, usually simultaneous with human conception? Uh, I do want you to be familiar with this idea of pre-existentism, that souls exist before the creation of a human being in conception. That is a Mormon idea. That is an idea that slips into the church sometimes, say in pro-life, groups that talk about things like contraception in ways that makes it seem like there are these souls waiting to be born that don't get to if you practice birth control. So uh, pre-existentism is not something the Bible teaches. I just want you to be familiar with these terms, understand them well. The big conclusions though is what I really want to make sure you understand as well. Top of 56, when you talk about what a human is, there are at least two constituent parts. We are at least dualistic at least dichotomist. We, we talk about the legitimacy, tr legitimacy of trichotomy, but we're at least recognizing a material and immaterial, a spiritual and physical part of the human being. But the emphasis in the Bible is on the unity of these two parts, of the body and soul. Uh, it's not enough to acknowledge that there's a spiritual and physical component. We've got to go to the next step and see what the Bible does all the time, and it's always trying to get us to appreciate the intended fundamental relationship between body and soul. We tend to either uh, overemphasize our physical being at the expense of our spiritual, but we can go in the other direction too and emphasize our spiritual existence, not appreciating the reality of the physical existence in that. And uh, on the pendulum swing, I think your generation tends toward the over-spiritualizing. Uh, on not seeing this fundamental connection between body and soul and that you grow spiritually in your body. It's not something you do independent of your body. It's something you do in your body. Has anybody ever read the Screwtape Letters? Yes, 
You didn't even have to, did you? You just read it to learn. Yes! That's beautiful. Well, uh, let me read this section. It's letters from a senior demon to uh, a younger demon trying, who's trying to corrupt the young man and keep him away from God. Lewis actually said it damaged his soul to take a demonic perspective for all the time he, he did in this book. But, but it's brilliant because the enemy throughout the book is God. And all of the good advice is bad advice, but it's good advice because it tells you what we shouldn't do. So listen as he talks about this advice on how to corrupt a young man when it comes to prayer. It's so related to what we're talking about when, it, when we talk about the unity of the body and the soul. He says this, My dear Wormwood, the best thing where it is possible is to keep the patient, this young new Christian, from the serious intention of praying altogether. When the patient is an adult recently converted to the enemy's party, like your man, this is best done by encouraging him to remember, or think he remembers, the parrot-like nature of his prayers in childhood. You know, make him remember, now he lay me down to sleep, as the Lord my soul to keep. In reaction against that, he may be persuaded to aim at something, and listen, entirely spontaneous, inward, informal, and unregularized. And what this will actually mean to a beginner will be an effort to produce in himself a vaguely demo devotional mood in which real concentration of will and intelligence have no part. One of their poets, Coleridge, has recorded that he did not pray with moving lips and bended knees, but merely composed his spirit to love and indulged a sense of supplication. That is exactly the sort of prayer we want. That's great. And since it is a, has a superficial resemblance to the prayer of silence as practiced by those who are very far advanced in the enemy's service, clever and lazy patients can be taken in, it, in by it for quite a long time. At the very least, and listen to this, at the very least, they can be persuaded that, for instance, their bodily position makes no difference to their prayers. For they constantly forget what you must always remember, that they're animals. And whatever their bodies do affects their souls. Oh, that's so important. He's saying they forget about this connection between their bodies and their souls. They forget that what they do in their bodies has an effect on their souls. And this is where we start to answer the question. So to grow spiritually is something that happens in my body. And I do so appreciate the desire to emphasize who we are as the foundation of all we're thinking about. But then who we are leads to what we do. And we are called to be fruitful to multiply and rule over and subdue and express our personhood in the image of God in these wonderful ways God enables us to. Without ever defining ourselves ultimately by that, but realizing that who we are is expressed in what we do. And actually, we deepen the realities of who we are in the expression of them by what we do. You know, you've heard, heard all these sermons and expressions. It's not about what you do, it's who you are. Well, yes and no. In that, I become more and more of who I am by what I do. And I express more and more of who I am in what I do. Isn't it Jesus who said, by your fruit you will know them? By their fruit you will know them? And, and what you do with your body matters. And so, we live in a world where this di dichotomy between body and soul exists. And we even talk about dying and going to heaven and the resurrection doesn't even seem important. You know, Jesus' work wasn't complete until he was resurrected and his body and soul were reunited and his work in our life isn't complete until we're resurrected and our bodies and souls are brought back together. Because God made us physical beings and spiritual beings with the intention that we would live for eternity expressing the image of God in these bodies and souls he's given us. And I do think on the pendulum swing, in an effort to not be merely external, formal, religious people, which you don't want to do rightly, we can go on the pendulum and now our spiritual life becomes so overly spiritualized that it's not about what I do in my body. And so we even have these ideas of, say, our sexual expression, which is purely a physical thing. And we're, we're told to be promiscuous all the time. And that's living and sleep with as many people as you can. And our souls get ravaged and we don't understand why. Because we miss this connection between our bodies and our souls, between what we do and what we are. As an expression of who we are, we live in certain ways in these bodies. 
So God made us to eat and drink and sleep. He made us to work and live. He made us to, to live these lives out in our bodies. And we talk more about that great question next time. Let me pray. Lord, help us, please, to think rightly about ourselves, about every human being we rub shoulders with, relate to. Lord, help us to be, be thinking rightly, and I pray there'd be radical transformation in our lives because of it. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.